Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, it's Tuesday, August 2nd. We're talking with Jonathan Krinsky from BTIG in Minneapolis. We'll uh, talk about this market. Last week, it was uh, you know the raging bull market, right? The S&P moving, accelerating to the upside. This week, it's more about choppiness. The S&P chopping around the NASDAQ as well at the end of the day. The S&P rotating downwards, finishing more at the lows of the day. Does this tell us we are confirming a key level of resistance? Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hey, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the best practices of technical analysis. The technical toolkit is really optimized. It's designed to help you navigate these sort of uncertain periods because it's all about quantifying trend, qualifying or quantifying momentum and qualifying price movements with all these techniques that help us better understand what is happening underneath the hood. And we have measures of price breadth and uh, and other uh, techniques to try to understand what's actually uh, what's actually moving. We also have a lot of different tools we can uh, we can apply things like sector rotation, leadership, laggership, looking at what stocks are working and what stocks are not. We'll try in 30 minutes to hit on as many of those themes as we can. This week, I would so far describe it two days in as choppy. Last week, it was all about accelerating to the upside, very much a risk on fuel, particularly after the Fed meeting. Um, this week, it's more about we've now had the rally and now we're chopping around. I feel like everyone's sort of holding their breath to see which way things go. We're very close from you know basically creating a scenario where it would be hard to argue the bear case much longer if we get above key resistance. But that's a big if. I think talking to my uh, guest today, Jonathan Krinsky, will uh, identify some of those key levels to pay attention to. I always talk about those lines in the sand. What's that level at which you would agree to revisit a thesis? Let's try to hit on as many of those as we can here. I'm excited to talk to Jonathan Krinsky here in a few moments. We have another great guest tomorrow on Wednesday the 3rd, Louis Giannis from Wealthnet Investments in uh, Colorado. Coming up next week on August 9th, we have Ari Wald from Oppenheimer joining us from New York. Also, a couple other special events this week. Tomorrow morning, we have airing our mid-year market outlook called Charting the Second Half. We have four uh, commentators. They will each answer a set of questions on outlooks for the S&P 500, for rates, for metals, and different sort of sector and, uh, and thematic plays as well. Great way to try to digest what has happened so far in 2022 and look forward in the months to uh, the five months to come. Also, our latest episode of The Pitch will be airing on Friday the 5th. Again, three commentators there, each pitching three, uh, excuse me, five stock ETF ideas. It's a great roundtable discussion on stock picking. Also, Larry Williams' latest uh, market update just aired on Monday. That's on StockChartsTV.com. Pretty bold up would be the way I would describe uh, Larry's take on the overall market. Might be really helpful to, uh, to look at that and see what sort of inputs he's using to draw those conclusions. Let's continue on today's show with our market recap. I do want to start with a poll. We always have a poll going on our live stream page at stockcharts.com, also on our social media accounts. So make sure you follow us on Twitter. Give us a uh, subscribe on the YouTube. And uh, here was the latest question we asked you. When do you make time for a weekly chart review? And I hope that I implied clearly enough in that question, you should have a time to have a weekly chart review. So I'm assuming, obviously, you should be doing a weekly chart review. When do you make it happen? Friday after the close, Saturday morning, Sunday evening, or I don't do a weekly chart review. So for the 3% of you that said I don't do a weekly chart review, shame on you. Find a time to do that. Make a regular uh, regimented time where you agree to go back and reflect on how the markets have evolved. Most of you said Saturday morning, uh, which is which is a great answer. The, and again, I, there's no necessary right answer to this except to have one. You know, for me, a weekly chart review, a morning coffee routine uh, every morning first thing, a monthly review, which I just did for my market misbehavior premium members and sent around this morning. Those regular structured reviews are really, really important. What I learned from managing a team of technical analysts 
years ago was it was less about how great of a, they were at stockbrokers, although they were very talented along those lines. It was the fact that they had a very disciplined, consistent process. That was the secret sauce. That was the magic. So make sure you have a good weekly uh, routine. Let's continue on with our market recap. I described this uh, this action as choppy. The last couple of days certainly has been the case. Last week really accelerated to the upside. It caused my medium-term trend model to not quite turn bullish, but very, very close. And now it's sort of hovering around that level. Um, for me, it's all been about the short-term strength within the context of a long-term bear market phase, which I would argue, I haven't seen enough evidence to declare that to be over just yet. Although I see the argument for further upside from here, I haven't seen enough evidence on the charts of the major averages. And I'll show you some of the things I'd be looking for. Today did not really help the bull case in terms of upside follow-through. Now that we've rallied up into the uh, you know above 4,100, we're testing that 4,150 to 4,200 range, testing the lows, or excuse me, the highs from, uh, from June. Uh, today, the S&P down about two thirds of a percent back below 4,100, around 4,091 at the close. The Nasdaq actually hung in there and was positive right until the end when things rolled over, finished down about 0.2%. The VIX is back higher a little bit, uh, just below 24. Other asset classes here briefly, we have interest rates uh, reverting back to the upside, kind of came off through the course of the day. Yesterday opened uh, a little bit lower and then uh, rates moving higher through the course of the day. The 10-year yield still just a little bit below 3%. Well, excuse me, the 30-year uh, the uh, yield a little bit below 3%. 10-year yields around 274. Uh, dollar index bouncing back to the upside, which is important. And I will tell you why. Uh, 2022 has been marked by a stronger dollar. It's been a wrecking ball of sorts for risk assets as the dollar has gone uh, has gone uh, so far to the upside. Pulled back here in the last month or so, and that has given space for things like gold to rally, for things like equities to rally because the the weaker dollar gives them that gives it that opportunity. Pulling back today, which is an interesting uh, an interesting uh, observation. Um, excuse me, bounce, bouncing higher today, which is a an interesting change from sort of the short term pullback that we've seen in uh in uh in the dollar as the dollar moves higher that's tough for gold to rally and even though the gld opened higher by the end of the day back down making new lows for the day around 164 uh silver down about two percent as well broader commodities uh down uh, overall choppy is how i would describe the cryptocurrency picture i don't think there's really uh, a clear trend measurement that i would call out at this point uh, both Bitcoin and Ether are sort of attempting to break out, but again, more choppy. And after this weekend, which was uh, which was plenty volatile, we're sort of trading around that level. Last couple of days, Bitcoin's been in the 22, 23 thousands, uh, but really just fluctuating uh, around that range. No real clear defined direction outside of that uh, congestion range. You know, briefly looking at a chart of the S&P 500, I've highlighted this blue shaded area uh, which is around 4150 to 4200. I, you know, I always talk about having a line in the sand, right? What's a level at which you have a, a certain thesis, you're bearish or bullish on a particular position at a particular time. You you analyze the chart and you draw a conclusion. Always define an exit strategy at that point. And, and when things start going poorly, that is not the time to start defining your risk and figuring out a stop. It's when you initiate a position, when you look at something and make your call, then you also, I think, need to include a, an exit strategy. But if this would happen, then I would need to revisit that thesis. And for me, still overall thinking structurally bearish on stocks until proven otherwise. The until proven otherwise part for me is the S&P uh, getting above 4,200. That would get it above this congestion area, above a Fibonacci level, above the resistance from, uh, from June. Uh, but that's the level I would be looking at. Now, what's interesting about that is if you look at um, Dow theory, particularly what I call the new Dow theory. So uh, Charles Dow had the Dow industrials and the Dow railroads, uh, which we now use the transports, but that's become less and less of a really accurate way, I think, of measuring what he was trying to do, which is basically looking at the producers and the distributors and, and seeing those two main parts of the economy and what they were doing. I use what's called a new Dow theory, which is the S&P and the NASDAQ, very loosely meaning the old economy names and the new economy names. Are they in agreement or are they not? Both of these indexes making new lows in June was a great uh, sort of uh, confirmation that overall the trend was still very much weak. Now what's happened though, neither of these made a new closing low in July, and now they are testing the highs from June. On a closing basis, the NASDAQ just got above there uh, uh, over the last couple of days, and that's something certainly to watch. What I would point out is that at the end of March, both of these just barely for a day or two got above 
their most recent swing highs before failing. And that's kind of the moment we are at right now. So the similarities are not lost on me between what we're seeing right now with the S&P and the NASDAQ and what we saw in the uh, in late March. Both of those times we attempted to get above the most recent swing high. We rolled over and then very soon after had a, a bearish confirmation where they both made new lows for the year. That's what I'd be looking at here. First off, can we get either of these or and ideally both of them above their June highs? That would be what, what's called a bullish confirmation. That would be a, you know, for simplicity, uh, a buy signal from Dow Theory indicating that both old and new economy names are uh, signaling an uptrend. Just to finish off briefly our market recap, all 11 of the S&P sectors uh, in, the, uh, in the red, although some of them had been positive going in uh, to the last hour or so, but that last sell-off really took everything down into the negative. The best performing sectors were communication services, which basically ended up flat along with utilities and energy, all three of those uh, down less than a quarter of a, of a percent. On the downside, the sectors really bringing things down were real estate financials, uh, industrials, materials, all down uh, over 1%. But again, for most of the day, none of the 11 sectors, 1% in either way. It was really more of a sideways, sort of a um, a digestion day. We've talked about that before. You had your big meal. That was last week's bull market big meal. Now we have the digestion phase where we digest this meal. Then we figure out what may happen next. When we come back after my break, I'll talk with Jonathan Krinsky, my guest, about where he see things, sees things headed from here. We'll be back in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close as we look at a bunch of charts, trying to make sense of these markets and trying to focus on key levels, key patterns, key signals to be aware of. A couple quick announcements before we get to today's guest, Jonathan Krinsky. First off, we're going to do a mailbag segment in a few moments after my, uh, my guest discussion and we would love to feature one of your questions in our next mailbag at the end of this week on Friday's show. You can get your, two, your emails to us in a couple of ways. Email is best, the final bar at stockcharts.com. And if you could include either a shot, a screenshot of the chart you're asking about, or a link uh, below the uh, charts on stock charts in an ACP, you have a way to send a link, a hyperlink, or what we call a permalink, which will allow me to see exactly the version of the chart that you're uh, that you're talking about. Send us your questions via email. We're also on Twitter at Final Bar SCTV, and we're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions and hope to answer one of yours live on the air on Friday's show. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. That's our on-demand platform. As I mentioned, Larry Williams' special just aired on Monday. We've had a lot of great uh, special events recently. And this week, we have our latest episode of The Pitch, Charting the Second Half, which is our mid-year market outlook. All of that will air live on Stock Charts TV on our live stream, but also soon after at StockChartsTV.com. On your mobile device, you can just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Jonathan Krinsky. Jonathan's a ma managing director and chief market technician at BTIG, coming to us from Minneapolis. Jonathan, it's good to see you again. How are you? Great, Dave. Always good to be here. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, we were talking before we uh, went live today just about the overall conditions. Obviously, uh, stocks, other risk assets have had a pretty decent rally last week and now sort of in a holding pattern. Take us through your chart of the S&P. What are you seeing here? Yeah, so we you know maintain a pretty cautious view, but I think as you mentioned, it's important to kind of have some levels where you might have to question that view. And we took a look back throughout history. And what we found is that once you've had a drawdown of 20% or more on a closing basis for the S&P 500, you rarely, if ever, we can't find any instances where you've actually exceeded the 50% retracement of that decline without having put in the final, without having already put in the final low. So what does that mean? It means if we were to take out 4231, that's the 50% retracement of the entire decline thus far, you know, the bear case would be pretty tough to defend historically because we've never seen that before. We've, you've had a 20% drawdown, reclaim 50% of that decline, and then went on to make new bear market lows. It just hasn't really happened. So I think that's a, a big level from our work. It, you know, it also kind of represents some, 
you know, meaningful prior support, now resistance. So, you know, that would be pretty impressive if the Bulls were able to, to take out that level. 42.31, it's a great level to uh, to focus in on, a little bit above the June highs there uh, as well. Your second chart's a monthly candle chart of the S&P. Yeah, so we know that July, the trading act, we call it an inside month. That means that the entirety of July's trading action was within the high and the low of June's um, trading action. And that's pretty unusual. It's not super rare, but it's pretty unusual. Um, and what we find is that if you take out either the high or the low of that prior month, so in this case, we're talking about June's higher low, um, you tend to see some follow through in the direction you take out. So if we were to take out on the upside 4177, that's June's high, um, that would be another indication that momentum and trend was was shifting in favor of the bulls. Again, we got it up to, I think, 4150-ish um, the last couple of days. So we got pretty close, but um, not quite there yet. So those are the, the two levels, I think, that you would have to start kind of conceding that maybe the bear case isn't as strong as we thought it was. Now, the breadth picture has certainly improved off of the June lows when things felt climactically negative. Walk us through your take on breadth. What's the read here? Yeah, so you've probably heard a lot about these breadth thrusts the last few days, especially end of last week. And we did see the most amount of 52, uh, sorry, four-week highs on the S&P since November of 2020, um, right after the election. We had about 55% of the S&P hit a four-week high. Um, and there's probably some, some good data on that signaling, maybe bullish looking out six and 12 months. And that could certainly be the case. I don't think it's a guarantee, but I think from a shorter term view, we went back and looked and kind of broke it apart when this happens, when you're above the 200 day moving average or when you're below the 200 day, like we are mm. currently. And when it happens below the 200 day moving average, average and median returns looking at 20 trading days are actually pretty negative the median returns nearly 5% of the downside following this, uh, this outcome. So I think, you know, just a little bit different perspective and, and kind of viewing that breadth thrust in context of what we still consider a downtrend is not quite as um, maybe as rosy as some of the other in, uh, indicators. Yeah. Interesting to bucket them on whether or not we're above the 200 day or, or not. That's actually a great way to think about that data, Jonathan. Your last chart uh, switching gears just a bit. Talk about the dollar. Dollar had been obviously a key story in 2022 until the last month, July, all of a sudden we see a big reversal to the downside. What's next in your view? Yeah. So, and we could throw yields on here as well. They're, they're kind of correlated. Um, we know that, that interest rates on the 10 year topped on June 14th, a few days before the overall market bottomed on June 17th. And then the dollar, as you see here, topped on July, 4, uh, July 14th, the day that the S&P put in its kind of higher low. And so there's a bit of an inverse correlation between yields and, and the dollar. Um, and I think from the dollar's perspective, 105 is a massive, massive level. We bottomed there this morning, put in a bullish reversal day to the upside. It's also the 50-day moving average. So you know, I think from a you know, kind of intermarket perspective, if we were to break back below 105, that would be pretty good risk on, a risk on environment for equities. But as long as we're above 105 on the dollar, I think you have to assume that um, equities are going to have a little bit of a headwind. And if you start pushing back up, you know, towards 107, 108, 109, where we were, um, you know, when, when equities are struggling, I think you're going to, again, see that um, parts of the market are going to come under some pressure. So given the fact, Jonathan, we only have about a minute left, but given this, this is a beautiful just narrative going through some of these different charts, obviously the S&P, the dollar at some key levels, what do you do here as an individual investor? Would you be looking to you know just be a, a waiting game until we break some of these levels? Is this a time to just hold out, a time to, a time to pause? Or are there opportunities that you're seeing that despite those headwinds and challenges still might uh, provide some upside here? Where are you looking opportunistically? Yeah, I mean, look, I think if if you haven't done any buying yet, um, I don't know that right now is the time to do it, despite the fact that we're pretty close to potentially, you know, those those levels that would shift kind of the medium or long term perspective a little bit more bullish. I think even if we have put in a major bottom, you know, you're going to see some pullback, some digestion, some consolidation. Um, you know, there's not many areas of the market that are in, you know, what we consider classic uptrends. Um, that would probably be limited to the kind of more inflationary commodity energy plays. So, mm -hmm. you know, those are probably still okay. Um, but I think a lot of the stuff that's kind of beaten down, the beaten down growth areas, you know, they're putting in small bases, but they're still in long-term downtrends. So we still have a lot to prove. So again, the point being, even if we're in this long-term transition into an uptrend, you know, I think you have plenty of time. I don't think it's just going to be a, a V-shaped move back to the highs. 
Jonathan, fantastic charts. Thanks as always for sharing some perspective with us. Uh, stay safe there in Minneapolis. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Dave. You too. That's Jonathan Krinsky. Jonathan's the uh, Managing Director and Chief Market Technician at BTIG coming to us from Minneapolis. I love if you listen to how he was describing those things. You know, I mentioned in the market recap about trying to define lines in the sand. What I love about Jonathan's take there is he had cle clear levels for the dollar, for the S&P. As long as we stay above this, there's a certain thesis. If, it, if we break this, then something's different. And I would encourage you with your own positions, with your own analysis, make sure you define those levels. I don't know if you noticed, by the way, but at the top, there's a little headline uh, across my own login because I was going through a bunch. I was basically going through the whole S&P 500 uh, over the weekend. I was identifying some levels and setting a bunch of alerts. And one of the alerts I set was PayPal above 90 because looking at the chart, I'm like, you know what? Unless it gets above 90, this is still sort of a consolidation phase. We get above 90. All of a sudden, this is something I need to revisit. Use the alert system, use the scanning engine to find some of those names that are uh, that are uh, testing or breaking some of those important levels. Great take there from Jonathan Krinsky at BTIG. Let's continue on our show today with the final bar mailbag. As a reminder, we're here to answer your questions. Our email is the final bar at stockcharts.com and please keep your great questions coming. Let's get to question number one. How do you rank regional ETFs year to date? I love that question. You actually included a series of tickers. And what I wanted to do was just show you, um, here's how I would answer that question and then I'll answer it. Uh, so number one, best thing to do if you're looking at a list of things is to create a chart list. So I went to my dashboard, I clicked on chart list, and then I went to new. I will call this um, Dave Kid. Dave's kids are great, just in case they watch the show. And then we are going to go here. From here, we can actually add symbols. And I'm going to do multiple, and I'm just copying and pasting directly from your question into here. I click on Add Charts, and now I have a list of the ETFs that you asked me about. Thanks for that. I'm going to click on Summary now, and this is where I can start to sort things. So I can bring in the RSI, and I can sort them from strength to weakness based on their momentum, right? And that is, you know, again, obviously looking at each chart individually. And I can see when I sort them on a momentum basis, it's India, then the S&P, and then kind of everything else after that, right? And that's based on where they're at in their trend cycle. The worst based on RSI from strength to weakness is China and then Mexico and then a broader uh, ETM, uh, excuse me, EM ETF. We can also sort it on the scooter rankings, which is what I tend to prefer because this is a percentile ranking looking at these ETFs and all the other ETF universe all in a big pile rank them based on their trend characteristics. So on both of these, you can see that India comes out number one. And so if you ask me to pick which of these is probably in the best setup, I'd probably say India, given the fact that it's uh, it has the strongest trend characteristics. While the S&P is attempting to get above its June high, charts like China are well below moving average resistance, have failed to mount any sort of uh, improvement. India looks like some of the technology names, kind of like Apple and others, Amazon maybe, that have gone above their June highs and appear to be holding that. I think India, the INDA ETF we're looking at here above 42, decent chart, not too bad there. Now, I would make sure you have stops all ready to go because I think the scenario that Jonathan and I were just talking about is very possible, which is the dollar rips to the upside or strengthens off of uh, its period of weakness, risk assets come off. And I think a stronger dollar and weaker risk assets is going to make India and a lot of other ETFs pretty challenged. The concern I have with all of these is that there are, uh, many of them uh, ha have become overbought or have had a nice run already. So if I had to pick one, I'd probably pick India, but more likely I'd be waiting to see uh, what happens with the, uh, with the US dollar before I get too excited about any of those non-US ETFs. But that chart list is the way that I would answer that question. And thanks so much for it. Question number two, what are the odds of Tesla breaking through the resistance of $900? And if it does, what is the next resistance? I understand the odds of heading back to $1,200 would be a real stretch. Let's look at the chart of Tesla here. When I was doing my uh, S&P 500 review over the weekend, this is one I, I stopped and, and thought about for quite some time because as I'm thinking about my overall sort of bear market rally thesis, which is what I've been going with here for the last month, um, Tesla and charts like this make me less and less comfortable with that thesis, and here's why. Tesla distributed April and May into a low in May. The market bottomed out in June, but Tesla actually made a higher low, and it's made a series of higher lows from there. This is really more of a consolidation period. Uh, we'll call this a you know a rectangle or probably even better 
a symmetrical triangle pattern, which resolved to the upside. We broke out of that pattern, retested the breakout level around 750, and then rotated to the upside, now testing the 200-day moving average. So I'm not excited about the fact that Tesla is overbought right at 900. So you asked about the odds of it breaking through 900. Right now, we're testing it, right? <laughs> In the last couple of days, we have now reached that level. We have reached the 200-day, and we're testing it. If you ask me to pick what are the odds, who I would probably say 70% that Tesla fails at the 200 day and 30% that it breaks through it. But um, that's me just basing on what I'm seeing elsewhere and the general headwinds to further upside from here because stocks like this have already had such a run that I would expect things to come off. Now, what's my, what are my, uh, the odds that Tesla eventually breaks above 900? I would say incredibly high, right? Even through year end, I would say uh, up in the 70, 80%. Uh, if not more, because I think charts like this eventually most likely resolve to the upside as charts usually do. I'm more concerned about whether it happens right now. Is there a possibility that we get back to 1200? Absolutely. Is that likely in the next month or two? I would say very much no. I probably put that down in the 10, 20% range, uh, but that's me. Again, if the S&P gets above 4200, 4250, I think the, the probabilities start to accelerate uh, that or, or uh, br dramatically increase uh, that those uh, those uh, unreachable levels become much more reachable. Final question probably for today. How come there are times when I see a whole industry group raised by a higher percentage than any stock in the group? And you actually had a pretty elaborate question. You're asking about some of the Dow Jones industry groups. The best way to see these, by the way, is if you go to charts and tools, go to industry summary. I like to do a table view. And this breaks down each one of the uh, industry sectors. And then the industry groups that comprise those sectors. And we're going down, you were asking in particular about, I think it was energy services, I want to say. Um, that might not be right. I think it was real estate services. I forget what it was. Yeah, real estate services, I think was the group you asked about. So basically, this group is up X percent today. How come when I look at the particular group, the names are not up, right? Some of the names are not up uh, enough. So here's what is most likely happening. I will tell you this. The Dow Jones industry groups are coming to us from Dow Jones. We get a feed from them on their price. We don't hand, hand calculate them. So I can't validate or verify what they are doing to calculate the individual returns on those indexes. What we do is we show the stocks that we consider part of those indexes, part of those industry groups. But I will tell you that we have gone through a whole painstaking process so that we feel comfortable about the 11 S&P sectors the Dow groups, and we have moved things around liberally when we feel like there could be a better classification. I will tell you, having spent many, many moons trying to optimize a sector and industry classification system it is a very imperfect and almost impossible undertaking. So there could be some inconsistencies based on which names we are considering part of those industry groups, how Dow is actually, Dow Jones is actually calculating their uh, individual returns, and also how we're handling dividends. So sometimes, uh, you know, dividends may be included or maybe not, and that could impact a daily return calculation, especially when stocks are going ex dividend, that can cause some weird, funky results uh, with the uh, with the calculations. That's a quick answer of what is most likely happening with the uh, with the group that you asked about. We need to wrap this show quickly. I was going all uh, crazy talking about the uh, the uh, the charts and your questions. Let's go to the three and three. It's going to be the three and one today. But let's get to it. Chart number one is looking at the commodity index. I loved uh, um, Jonathan Krinsky's take on a potentially stronger dollar. I think that's a real risk here, potentially, you know, especially given the pullback that we've seen in the dollar, the rally that we've seen in risk assets could be certainly a time for that trend to be a breather. I'm looking at the chart of commodities. The DBC came off in June, July, potentially a bear flag pattern. That's when you have a counter trend move, move a parallel move of higher highs and higher lows. We break out of that pattern to the downside. This measures a lot lower. Getting below 24 to 24.50 would take us below the July low and also below the 200-day moving average. That's a risk to the bullish energy thesis if that's part of your uh, conclusion right now. Chart number two, Caesars Entertainment, CZR. A lot of focus on the travel and tourism trade, renewed optimism that people want to travel and spend money and go gambling. Uh, CZR is up 7% today. I like the break above the 50-day moving average. That's nice. And also the breaking above 45, holding that would be key. Measures maybe to 6730. That'd be the first Fibonacci level. Finally, I like uh, Jonathan Krinsky's take on breadth and sort of the extreme upward breadth we've seen. I'm seeing the same thing with the percent of stocks above the 50-day moving average. Got up to around 76%, very similar to what we saw at the end of March and the beginning of January. Two meaningful tops. Do we see a similar top now? Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thanks for watching as we go through all of these charts. Special thank you 
to Jonathan Krinsky from BTIG. For StockCharts.com, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.